Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the launch of the Alumni Webinar Leaders Series. I'm Molly Ashley, the Alumni Engagement Manager at Brooks, and I work in a development and alumni team within the Marketing and Communication Directorate. We have been running alumni webinars throughout the years and inviting some of our key alumni to share their stories, which have ranged from career journeys to taste and book launches. This series focuses on four of our key alumni leaders, and I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker, Heather Carter. Oh no, what's happened? Hi Heather, I think Molly's having some connection issues, but we can still see and hear you well. So. You still hear me? Okay. Oh, okay. So she works with a great number of lovely people and um, works in a stunning setting. Maybe um, just go ahead and I'll try and message Molly. I think she's gone offline again. All right. Did she ask any questions? Do you know? Not as far as I can tell. Um, she's just disappeared on, on the screen. OK. Here. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Heather Carter. I'm the operations director at Blenheim Palace. And it was really, really lovely of Molly to ask me to talk to you today um, as part of this webinar series. Um, I expect a lot of you know Blenheim Palace, but um, just in case you don't, it's a, a beautiful place um, in, in um, um, building World Heritage Site in, in the centre of Oxfordshire, West Oxfordshire. It was built for John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough in 1704, as a gift from a grateful nation for winning the, because he won the battles of Spanish succession in, in, in Blindheim. If it hasn't been for him, we'd have all been speaking a different language, maybe French or Spanish or German. Um, but he really helped to shape the, to change the shape of, of Europe and to, to keep us um, in, in a very good place. It's also the birthplace of Winston Churchill. We opened to general public in 1950 and we were acknowledged as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1987. We have about 12,000 acres of parkland, which includes some of Europe's oldest oak trees, and we now have our 12th Duke, so we've had 12 Dukes to date. And we, we are an amazing site, and we have many stories to tell. So, hello Molly, you're back with us, I can see. <laughs> Sorry about that, the te technical issues, as they say. <laughs> Did you hear the last question or was it? <laughs> no. Did um, you so ask was... <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. So, um, the question was, um, you've, you've seen a lot of challenges and changes over the years. Um, can you tell us a bit more um, about how your roles changed over the years and, and how your day to day works? We were talking a bit earlier about something you were doing today. It sounds very exciting. What, what is it? Is there an average day? Can you, can you is there something a standard day or is it? Uh, completely different um, how well, does it look every day is different Molly I have to say I don't think any day is ever the same at Blenheim it's like going on a stage you don't know what's going to happen and at the end of the day you look back on the performance and think was that good or was that bad and how did we do but um so just to tell you a little bit about me at Blenheim Palace I started um, in 1997 as a visitor catering manager so I've been there for quite a long time and in fact, that wasn't my first time of being at the palace. When I was a student at Oxford Polytechnic, which is now Oxford Brooks, 
um, in the early 80s, I worked for a company called Town and County Catering, who had the royal warrants for um, the garden parties at Buckingham Palace. And we, as a group of students studying catering at Oxford Poly, we were asked to go and waitress on some of their lovely um, banquets and at the garden parties, which we did. And they actually ran some of the, of the parties at Blenheim Palace. And in those time in the 80s, the 11th Duke um, was a, a real socialite and loved having dancing and parties and grandeur. And I remember being there one night um, working on a ball. It was the Dr. Bernardo's ball where they raised thousands of pounds worth of money and Princess Margaret flew in by helicopter. And it was just seeing how the other, other half of the world lived, which we obviously didn't experience, and really gave me a taste for that type of um, entertainment and working in that world, which, um, which I went on to do. So um, when I left um, Oxford um, Poly, now Oxford Brooks, I went to London and worked in some amazing sites. Um, I worked in banqueting in the city of London. I worked at um, the uh, National Gallery running restaurants. I worked at Liberties in Regent Street. I worked in um, catering in Kew Gardens. I had a really rounded experience of catering. And then um, I was offered a job at Blenheim Palace in 1997 um, as a visitor catering manager for Contract Caterer. And I couldn't say no to not going to work in that amazing place. And what an opportunity to go back to something I'd experienced as a, as a, as a student. So I started there as a, as a visitor catering manager in 1997. As I said, we had 300,000 visitors a year um, at, at that time. We now have about 900,000 um, in a normal year, talking 2019, not last year, obviously. Um, we have very few events when, in back in the in the in the 90s. We closed the business from October to March, so it wasn't really about the visitor business when I joined. It was very much about country estates, hunting, fishing, shooting, and the family living in the house. Um, and that went on for quite a long time. But then in 2001, um, foot and mouth hit, and that deeply affected the farming business and, and as a country estate it deeply affected Blenheim Palace and, and the estate um, and that was a bit of a wake-up call to the trustees and to the people managing the estate because they really realized they couldn't really commercially rely on farming incomes they need to look to other places and they've got this small business small visitor business going and actually I think the Sunday trading had just started opening up at those times and people were starting to do more at weekends so they decided to change the focus of the estate, they brought in a chief executive officer and changed the running of the estate from land management to somebody running it as a business. And we really focused on the visitor business and really drove it hard. So it's all about getting the visitors, paying visitors to Blenheim Palace and building those numbers and, and, and making some money. And, and we did. Um, by this time, I was um, the general catering manager I've been working for Sodexo Prestige, the contract caterer on manage, caterers on site. And um, we'd actually started building the business in catering. We were doing better than the palace. We had some brilliant weddings going on. The orangery had developed and we were doing events in the park. And if, I was even um, employing Punch and Judy shows to go outside the cafe to keep it going because there was nothing else going on at the palace. And I was very frustrated with what was going on. And I had this conversation with a new chief executive um, several times and then in 2005 she said to me Heather if you're that frustrated why don't you come and do the job why don't you come and be our head of operations and I said oh I only know about catering and hospitality I don't know anything about historic house management or looking after painting paintings and artifacts and guided tours and ticketing and security and the, I, I said, but you know I'll give it a go and and I learned very quickly and that there are always lots of experts out there you can pull on their knowledge it's just being brave and going and asking the questions so we had a few exciting years of growing the visitor business and and we really worked hard on doing that and we and we and we looked at the visitor visit business not only as um the palace and coming to learn about the history but what else could we do so we opened up new exhibitions in spaces that had never been used so opened up the untold story in the upstairs tour um so what, what used to be bedrooms and staff accommodation became a story um mm -hmm. i have to say that one we learned a little bit from because um 95 of people liked it 5% of people absolutely hated it. It was really Marmite, but we learned from that experience. Yeah. Um, and it's still open today. Um, we introduced new events such as triathlon, music festival, festival country fire, the Easter events, and really brought the park to life and drove tickets through that way. 
we took on um, filming. So the palace is, had been used for filming for many years. We had, um, long before my time, Black Beauty and, and Hamlet. But then we managed to get Mission Impossible, Young Victoria, Bond, um, uh, Gulliver's Travels with Jack Black. So lots of lots of exciting filming, which pays lots of money. Any stately home wants filming. Uh, we had some celebrity weddings. John Terry, um, the footballer, Malvin Hume and Rochelle, they got married. So there was some some quite good parties when when those weddings were on. We had the dual fashion show. And of course, we've had contemporary arts. We brought in Ai Weiwei, um, Rizzio Catalan with the Golden Toilet, which you might remember went missing um, last year, which was a bit of a, a stressful time for us, but you know, um, we carry it on. Um, this year we've had Cecily Brown. So you can see we've thrown everything into the visitor business and, and very, very successfully 900 visitors a year, as I said, in 2019. But just looking back a bit, we, we did have had some changes along the way. So in 2014, the estate had a, bit, a big change with the death of the 11th Duke. And mm. he had been the custodian of the, the estate for many years. Um, and it was very upset, upsetting for everybody. But this led to other changes, as these things do. And the senior management team um, changed. And in 2017, um, I was offered the position as operations director. Um, which was and still is a huge privilege. So my role changed um, again from head of operations to operations director. Um, and at this time, we, we looked at what we achieved over the last few years, a very successful visitor business, um, really being very commercial about what we did. We thought it was time to sit back and think about what Blenheim really meant today, because we're 20 years on from when I started. Um, and in that time, we had created the Blenheim Palace Heritage Foundation. So we've got a charity element to think about as well. And we think, what should what should what should a big estate like Blenheim be trying to achieve? And and we came, we decided the purpose of a landed estate today is to be the lifeblood of the local economy, to enhance the lives of local people and to share and protect our amazing place. And we've set ourselves goals to achieve this by um, running um, by running a profitable visitor business. So it's still about yeah. running this as a visitor attraction, but the profits are used to fund a, a restoration program, which is about it was about 40 million pounds over 10 years. We're some way into that now, um, mm. although um, COVID has has put, paid a couple of projects, but we will we will move on to do those. Um, mm. And we really are focusing on what we can give back to the community. So, so mm. that's that's what I've done over the last sort of 20 years in a in a snapshot. And what do I do today? Well, I'm very still very much involved in the day to day business. Um, my team will probably say too much. Um, I'm mm. always wanting to know what's happening, why is it happening, why is that there, and why is not. What? Anyway, tell me to go away. Um, <laughs> but I'm very much planning on the next 10 years and beyond. Um, we can't afford to sit back and hope the visitors keep coming. Um, mm. There's too much competition for people's time. So um, I'm, I'm looking back, you know, how, how have we changed over the last five years and what's going to happen over the next five years? And, and we want to be ahead of the game. So I was telling you today, I was out um, in the wall garden looking at possibilities for a, a lovely adventure playground to complement the wall garden area and bringing that mm. whole area back to life. So growing vegetables, growing flowers, having a sensory garden and, and really um, bringing it back and so it's sort of sustainable and connecting with the environment. So so really exciting times actually. Yeah, yeah, no, it, I, so you've been, you've been, it's, it's developed so much over the years and I hadn't realised that. Being an Oxford resident, I pop, I've tucked in over the years and seen bits and it, it's amazing. I'm thinking um, how much change there is and, and how exciting it is for the future as well. Um, I was thinking about um, going back to sort of the agile working working theme for uh, for one of our discussion points. Is I mean, you have a, a this a, this large um, attraction that you're you're managing, and we've talked about the challenges and, and stuff. But what what is it around the uh, importance of this agile working um, model that is quite popular at the moment to talk about? Uh, what what does that mean to your team and and your um, the management style have you seen a big change recently or is it something you've all you so, might have all, all done so i I think, I think that um anybody working in the leisure industry has always had to be agile there's so many challenges out there and and it's not only challenges you have to always be aware of 
what the trend is, what customers want. You know, people's people's mindset change it change, and 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 I think anybody in our business has to be agile or you know just alert as to what's happening and flexible so you've got yeah. to be able to to just take in all the elements and make a plan and then be, be able to change that plan if 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 it doesn't work so we've we, you know over the last few years i mentioned we had um foot and mouth i mean that that 20 years ago that the state changed because it had to but we have things like global warming you know flooding heating snow we never know what's going to happen we've got a huge event event program which we put in every year um, but we don't know what's going to happen and we can have a, a year of rain and we have to then adapt our event program because maybe we can't use our car parks or, you know, we know that it's actually going to be a heat wave. So we've got to have plans for watering stations. We've just got to be alert as to what's happening. The economic climate, you know, we've been through a recession and we launched our annual pass off of a back of an, an economic climate because we, we thought our visitor numbers are just going to just fall off and what can we do to keep people coming oh well let's try an annual pass so buy one day get 12 months free really yes. good value and actually we, we thought we'd try that for three months then we extended it for six months and we just saw that as somebody bought an annual pass they came had great fun came back bought their friend and they bought an annual pass and actually we've never looked back on the annual pass it's just grown from strength to strength mm -hmm. terrorism mm -hmm. terrorism we have to be aware of um so yeah. again being aware that actually something's happening in the world and people aren't going to travel so you have to change your business model so you're not going to get the, the visitors from America how can you substitute, substitute those visitors and attract different visitors um, yeah. shortages of labor all those things so I think that um, you know we we are flexible and agile and and, and anyway and just because we have to be and keeping the product alive creating people reasons for people to keep visiting we can't just you know sit back and and just deliver the same thing every day so again what do people want what can we do what can we, can we change i think my background in hospitality and catering managers they said you know i think if anybody in the leisure business i think is if you're going to be successful in that world and i always say this to the students i mentor You've got to be alert. You've got to know what's going on. You've got to, um, you know, you've got to be on your toes and be able to think out the box all the time. Um, that way, you'll be successful in business. Don't just form a plan and go with it because, you know, something's going to knock it sideways. So just, just, you know, be aware of what's going on. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's true with it. With the hospitality, particularly, it's always been quite an agile work force hasn't it Have, having to be because of the uh, evenings and flexible time during the day um you know you've probably always got that flex within catering and hospitality particularly so i um, think it, some companies through covid have have had to learn how to be agile because there are some companies yeah. that actually haven't had to change they worked in a certain way for hundreds of years and it's a successful recipe and it's worked but now they found they can't open up their offices they can't open up their shops and they've had to they've had to think differently and it's been a struggle but you know when when February came in 2019 we um we, we we saw COVID was coming around the corner and we didn't know what was going to happen but we wrote we wrote plans for various scenarios so we were yeah. ready to close and as soon as we closed we worked really hard so we would be ready to open as soon as we could and and we worked with um with our, uh, with our peers with the other historic houses with alva the association of large visitor attractions bouncing ideas off of what they were doing what was working for them what you know what their thoughts were and we all very quickly moved on to um online booking systems for instance and none of us had dreamt we'd ever have to do online booking i mean that's something that legoland did because they had to control yes. their numbers we never had that problem but we very quickly moved on to online booking and we're now a cashless site well who knew in 2019 we weren't going to be having cash anymore but i don't yeah. think we'll ever, i don't think we'll ever go back to cash on site i think it will all be cashless yes um, yeah yeah and, yeah, and the booking going, the booking system's working well. Is it the the um, online booking system? I, I I've done it myself, so I, I, it it does seem pretty easy to do and time slots, and and that that uh, also uh, comes on to the question about the project you're working that you've been working on with Brooks Research Team with the AI. That that must be part of that, um, you know, part of that sort of piece of work as well of of seeing where uh, your visitors are where they like what they're doing times they're coming in and and round in and that must wrap around also with the agile working and your staff team and how you manage those staff hours um 
what, it's a really what, how long have you been doing the AI project? You'd like to tell us a little bit more about that, how that works. That's very interesting. So it's a really exciting project. Um, so we're working with um, Dr. Um, Yeo Teramoto um, from the um, Oxford University, with Dr. Rolf um, from the School of Engineering, Computing and Maths, and Dr. Jack Paul Jackson and Dr. Diane Limburg for Oxford Brooks. Mm. Um, and they're working with our, um, we have an innovation department. So they're working with our head of innovation, David Green. So it, it's a really great opportunity for us to collaborate with the university and something that, you know, in the past we may not have done and in the, on the doorstep. So this project actually started in the midst of the pandemic in July 2020, um, which presented some challenges because um, we, you know, we literally were in lockdown and then we opened. And the projects we were going to do, they had to sort of think out the box and think, well, what can we do differently? So mm. the, the first thing they started doing was really helpful because we moved to online booking, but we had no idea how, how to manage this online booking, how many uh, slots to give to annual pass holders, paying ticket holders. Um, we could work out how many people we could have per slot, but how were they going to book them and how was it going to work? So um, we used the... Um, AI to, um, to, 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 to track what was happening. And we worked out um, that ev not everybody booked a slot showed up, especially annual pass holders. And it became actually quite well known across the industry that about 20% of annual pass holders or members of any um, leisure site didn't show up because they didn't need to pay. So actually they book a slot and if they didn't feel like coming, they didn't come. Mm. We also had a large number of visitors booking time slots overnight. So the, the, the operations team would make a plan one day, go home, come back, and actually they planned for a thousand visitors, and actually they've got two thousand visitors, and they hadn't, mm. you know, so there was no yeah. warning of that happening. So the AI started building up patterns of how time slots of bookings were working, and um, that way our staff could be prepared for queue management and and opening the catering units. They had some warning, and it wasn't they didn't have to come in that day and discover at 10 o'clock in the morning, oops, we're, we're not ready. So that was mm. really helpful. But then we also mm. moved on to um, the light trail. So we had, again, to um, manage our, 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 our capacities on the light trail. And David and the team working with the, with the, the, the Brooks and University crew um, installed some footfall sensors around the light trail, which tracked the visitors and where the pinch points were. So this was really helpful because we could we knew where the pinch points were and we could take action then to to try and avoid that by moving things or doing things but also we could see a picture live so if it was building up you know the queues were building we could send somebody down there to dissipate the queues or to hold people back so that they spread out so we could see it, it was really really useful um mm. so going forward we've got some projects coming up um mm -hmm. which is probably um you know actually building on what we did with the um light trail so we're going to put some sensors around the park um and, and track where people go around the ground so as we open up in march we again we can see if we've got any anywhere that you know might might cause issues because of, of crowding but for me it's also about tracking people's behavior so we yeah. can start tracking behaviors uh, different times of the year or different days of the week when we've got different crowds in where do people go what do they do what do they want to see you know yeah. and we can see what what's happening and I think you know that's going to be such a useful tool going forward in the future yeah it's great feedback that yeah, <laughs> yeah and if you're just you know because to have to see what what people like and what what's what they'd like more of as, as you develop um which you always are developing it seems to me and that's just great feedback, isn't it, to get that information? It is. It is. And there's one other project that I'm going, to, I'm going to challenge them to. So when I was a catering manager, I used to have to decide how many sandwiches to make each day. And um, it, so you look back on the last two years of information, how many sandwiches did you sell on that day over the last two years? Then how many, what was the weather like on those days? Were there any external events like royal weddings, football, rugby cup finals? Because that affects people's behaviour on site, whether they come, whether they're not going to come, and is what's going to affect this year on that day. Um, mm. Were there any events in the Palace in the Park, and how many coaches are booked? And if you get all that right, you can actually mm. predict the number of sandwiches you need to make to sell. So, and that's, yeah. <laughs> we all want to avoid food waste. So I'm really hoping they'll come up with a solution to my sandwich problem. Yes, or glasses of mulled wine round the, the trail. Or glasses of mulled wine, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Uh, that's